Welcome back to KNTV and to another story from our archives filmed back in the noughties. It's the story of Mary, the wife of Douglas Gresham and daughter-in-law of C.S. Lewis. Now Mary lived happily in Africa until the age of five when her family sent her away to boarding school. She felt unloved and abandoned and so sought love in all the wrong places only to find that she was abandoned again. But then true love found her. I spent the first five years of my life living in Africa because my father was uh, at the time acting district commissioner of Tanganyika. I spent uh, most of my childhood on the back of um, a black lady called Tausi Binti Simba who was my ayah at the time. She looked after me till I was five years of age and uh, when I was five my parents um, had to get out of Africa because Africa was a, a bad place to be rearing white children, um, mainly because of the disease factor. So my mother located us all to Tasmania where I was put into um, a boarding school when they first got to Tasmania. I felt abandoned by my mother at this school. Um, I came home only once a year at, on the long Christmas holidays and I was very young and I felt that uh, they, they didn't want me, they didn't love me and uh, I felt almost parentless and, and homeless. One of my uh, phrases that, you know, that I associate very much with my mother was uh, you know, whenever I was hurting about something, even when I'd physically hurt myself, fallen over and scraped my knee or something, it was always offer it up, offer it up for God. Offer it, in, in other words, offer it up for your sins. It's as though, you know, the more pain we had to suffer, the sort of whiter we'd become and more acceptable to God. Well, it was on that account that I started to loathe God. I started to think, that if he, wants, if he wants me to sort of live a life of unhappiness, live a life of even pain to please him, then I'm sorry. I just you know, can't go along with that. When I left school, I went uh, and did my nursing training. I began to live double standards now. I was... Uh, uh, still very much a pretentious a little holy Joe um, in the hospital among the nuns. But out in my private life, I was uh, very much um, living as they would have called it mortal sin. Um, I, because of my um, rejection as a child, I sought human affection um, from um, other human beings, and at this and at this particular time of my life, um, I discovered boys, and I discovered that uh, um, that they actually liked me. Nobody had really liked me much as a kid, or I never thought they did. And all of a sudden, I was liked, but it was by the the male population. And uh, um, thinking to myself that that these boys were liking me. I um, did everything to please them, but uh, now, on hindsight, looking back, it wasn't me that they were after. It was the pleasure that I could give them. Finding myself now pregnant and uh, pretending to be one thing to the nuns and being another thing in reality. Um, t my living this double life, living this hypocritical life. Um, the worst thing that it did, the most shameful thing that, that it did, was um, <coughs> to lead me to commit murder, to murder my own unborn child. And um, <coughs> even um, 
afterwards um, murdering my own unborn child, it was a th a, it, it was um, t am amazingly t oh, it was deeply, deeply distressing to me when the realization of um, my hypocrisy had caused me to do this. This is how far it had got. And I continued that pretense as though nothing had happened. I knew that I had done wrong. Um, I continued my pretense of being holy. Um, I continued my double standard life. Um, l looking back on it now, I, th I think I must have been a, a despicable creature because I was so hypocritical. Immediately after my nursing training, I moved to London. So I went to my uncle's farm and as I stepped off the train, a young lad who was working on the farm as an agricultural student um, was sent with my cousin Harzi to meet the train. And we stood on the railway station and waited and then this young lady Mary stepped off the train and I decided to marry her. And this young lad's name was <laughs> Douglas Gresham. I had seen suddenly this girl that I had been looking for all my life and I recognized her instantly. He completely, <coughs> he completely overwhelmed me with love. I think it's, I think that's why it's emotional. It, this was my the first time, first time in my life I had experienced love. But I rejected him. Initially, when she first met me, of course, Mary didn't really want to have anything to do with me. Douglas was quite often unshaven. He, he um, wore farm clothes. I was too young. Uh, I was penniless. I was scruffy. I wasn't a very prepossessing specimen at all. He asked me to marry him for three years, and I continually said no. Um, but I think probably in the end, what really got through to her was the fact that I really did love her. And I don't think anybody else really had before then. Eventually, I realized that I would never ever, I had never ever, and I would never ever come across anybody that would love me like this. It took three and a half years, uh, but we've now been married 32 years. So it was obviously uh, the right thing to do at the time. Through the following months, through the following years, um, I discovered that you know I'd, I'd married um, the stepson of one of the world's most famous writers. I had never read any of C.S. Lewis's books, um, mainly because they were t of on Christian topics. Um, Christianity and God had become a very taboo subject for me and uh, I never ever wanted to go down that road again. Um, I, think I, th I think I never ever wanted to be hypocritical and pretentious again. I thought that, you know, once I got married and once I had this man to love me, once I had my own children, um, this would be um, the, the healing of everything and, and everything would work, you know, I'd have my own place, my own children, and it would uh, all work out for the good and I could be happy, I could find happiness. Um, but uh, here I was, all I had found was this uh, <laughs> new emotion called anger and it motivated my life. I was always angry. Angry gives you enormous energy. But the release of energy is just absolutely unreal. Um, anger, th the anger I believe stemmed from the fact that um, I had uh, really thought that Doug would fulfill all my, all my needs for happiness. 
having been deprived of real loving relationships as a child, Mary began to feel, as many people do, that if she found a real love, that would solve all of her problems, all of her emotional difficulties and the anger and so forth. And of course it doesn't. What I had done was I had um, put Doug into the place of God. He had become my God. And of course, we do this all the time in our relationships. We, we rely on other people to be God to us and for us. And they can't possibly live up to, to, um, to God's um, provisions for us and his ability to, to love us so unconditionally. Um, so the, the anger just, just built and built. A gift arrived in, in Doug's suitcase of a taped edition of um, one of C.S. Lewis's uh, best-known books, Mere Christianity. And uh, quite frankly, I was a bit disgusted when I saw this. And uh, I just put it on top of all his other books and writings. And they, like, like the books, collected dust for about 12 months before I ventured one day, just out of boredom, I put one of these tapes on to see what they were like. And I was very, very cautious, very, very apprehensive because I had my finger on that stop button. Because I was not going to take any of this go to Jesus stuff from anybody. I was not going to be indoctrinated with this ever again in my life. I listened to that first tape. I listened to the second tape. I listened to all ten of those tapes. There was a little clause in the, in the tape that uh, gave me pause and made me wonder. In the tapes, it um, was quite plain that God knew us and that God loved us. Well, I thought to myself, if anybody really knew me, they couldn't possibly love me. I used to pretend to be good, and uh, most of my life was a pretense, even, even at this stage. Even although I had um, a devoted husband and four healthy school-aged children, I had no financial worries, uh, the farm was ours, um, I had nothing to be concerned about. My life seemed empty and drab. Um, I didn't really know where I was going, why I was here, or, um, or what the purpose of it all was at this stage. So um, when these tapes told me that God knew me and he loved me, I thought, no way, there's a contradiction here. If God really knew me, he couldn't possibly love me. And so I put the tapes away and um, very sadly, I must say, because I, I really and truly t just longed for it all to be real, um, I dismissed the whole subject and thought this, this couldn't be right. If God really knew me, he couldn't possibly love me. It wasn't long after that that I picked up a Bible in the house. And uh, although I wasn't fond of reading and had done very little reading in my life, there was now a topic that I wanted, really seriously wanted to know about. And so um, I read the whole um, New Testament. It was the most exciting book that I had ever, ever read. It was the most amazing personal love story from me to God that I had ever, ever read, that, that God not only should love me like he did love me, but uh, that he had done so much for me. I was discovering all these w wonderful truths out of the Bible. It was only through letting Jesus take my sins from me that I was able then to have a relationship with God. And uh, the thing that came as a, a wonderful relief was that I didn't have to do anything about it personally. He had done it all for me. There was no such thing anymore as doing penance for my sins or, um, or doing um, 
um, exorbitant church activities and, and uh, religious duties and things like this. Jesus had done it all for me. And the um, realization of that really gave me a feeling inside myself that I just, I could just worship this man, you know, for having done so much for me, for releasing me from such bondage that I was I've in. Gone through this myself, you know, My family noticed a difference in me so straight away. Very, very I'd lost my anger. I used to always be angry inside. She managed to dispense with the anger that had dwelt within her for such a long time. Much of the, I think much of the pain that she had lived with since early childhood was not gone, it didn't go away, but it was addressed. Life had a different purpose and a different priority now. I was nice to people to please God and not just to make myself appear lovable. She began to address interrelationship problems with a totally different viewpoint. And slowly but surely, she became a very impressive person to live with. This was 16 years ago. Um, since then, I have um, pursued this uh, line of thought along God's Word and, and through his Bible um, to it with, with tremendous energy. I have never ever stopped. It's been a, a relentless, um, not, not a searching. I have found what I'm looking for. It, is, it has just been a joy, a joy to, 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 to walk with this real God um, and to, to not have to pretend him anymore, a joy to be real myself and not have to t pretend to be something that I wasn't. Um, a lot of people in those early days thought that uh, this was just a fad that I was going through and I'd soon get over it. I never have got over it. I never would get over it. There is absolutely nothing in comparison to this. Absolutely, totally nothing to um, compare with what I have found. To, to go back to my pre-Christian days would be like going back to some form of madness.